your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 27. Matthew chapter 7, <clears throat> verses 21 to 27. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you who behave lawlessly. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. Rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. This is the word of the Lord. Lord Jesus, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight. Amen. A man was once organizing his summer vacation at a tropical resort. The plan was for him to go on ahead, and his wife would join him a day later. Well, soon after arriving at the resort, he sends his wife an email back home, except that he mistyped her email address, and his email found its way to a devout but recently widowed old lady. Her husband had passed away only a few days ago. Well, when this little old lady read the email, she first turned pale and then fainted. Her family heard a thump and rushed into her room to find her on the floor with the email displayed on her laptop. And here's what the email said. Darling, I just want you to know that I have arrived safely. I'm looking forward to you joining me here tomorrow. <laughs> By the way, it's really hot down here. <laughs> have you ever received the wrong message? As Christians, we can receive a number of wrong messages about what it means to be a Christian. Here's a few examples. When you become a Christian, all your problems will go away. You'll never have another storm or crisis in your life. God will protect you. Or oh, how about this one? You are a Christian if you simply call yourself a Christian or call Jesus Lord. Oh, here's the last one. To be a Christian means you don't have to do anything because Christ has done it all. Have you heard any of these? 
These messages are just plain wrong. And in today's scripture reading, Jesus himself debunks each of these. And to hear him speak these words, we must travel back in time to find Jesus sitting on a mountain. Anyone know what this mountain is called? Anyone been to Israel? This is the Mount of Beatitudes that overlooks the Sea of Galilee. A crowd has gathered around Jesus to hear him speak, but he addresses his words to his disciples. In effect, telling them, this is what it means to be my disciple. To be my disciple is to be poor in spirit, to be spiritually hungry and needy and dependent on God. It is to be meek and gentle, to hunger and thirst for righteousness, to be a peacemaker, to go beyond the letter of the law and fulfill the spirit of the law, to love your enemies, to give to the poor, to have a relationship with God that is private and not pretentious, to not worry but to trust in God, to focus more on your own faults than the faults of others. This is what a true disciple of mine looks like. And having said all this, Jesus ends what will come to be known as the Sermon on the Mount with today's scripture reading. The essence of which is, apply this. Put my words into practice. Otherwise it counts for nothing. And to illustrate this point, Jesus tells the parable of a wise man who built his house on rock and a foolish man who built his house on sand. Two houses that looked great on the surface, but one was a ticking time bomb, a disaster waiting to happen. One day when that storm hits, and notice the storm hits both houses, Only one remains standing, and the other crashes to the ground in a huge pile of wasted effort. Now, Jesus' audience would have understood this parable in a unique way. You see, just below them were the banks of the Sea of Galilee, made up of alluvial sand. During the hot summer months, this sun-baked sand would become hard. And on the surface, it would seem like a perfectly suitable foundation. But during the winter months, when the river Jordan swelled and caused the Sea of Galilee to burst its banks, that sandy soil becomes soft again. And woe to the builder who built his house on that sand. A wise builder would dig past the sand, dig deep, until he reached the underlying bedrock before laying his foundation. In the modern world, we, we see plenty of examples of firm versus weak foundations. Has anyone been to see the Leaning Tower of Pisa? Colin? Oh, Mariana? And Kiki? Yep, that engineer ain't receiving any awards. Back in 1173 AD, when construction began, the foundations were laid, but only three meters deep, and on clay soil. After the third floor was built, the locals were shocked to discover the tower had a slight lean. 
Over the years, various attempts were made to correct the lane. For example, one side of the upper floors was made slightly taller to compensate, but this only made the problem worse. In 1934, Benito Mussolini ordered the tower to be strengthened, saying it was a national embarrassment to Italy. But his efforts made the tilt even worse. You see, it doesn't matter what you do above the surface if you have problems below the surface. A fancy building isn't going to compensate for faulty foundations. On the other hand, look what happens when foundations are wisely laid. The west coast of the South Island, which is by far the wettest region of New Zealand, is prone to storms and floods. In fact, on occasion, the west coast has received more rainfall in one day than Auckland's total annual rainfall. And that's where I was in the summer holidays. Thankfully, blessed with good weather. But one of the huts we stayed at was called Ghost Lake Hut. Look at what it's built on. A great big slab of rock. The rains may come, but that hut isn't going anywhere. Or take skyscrapers. I'm always amazed at how tall they can get. Manhattan Island in New York is home to some of the tallest buildings in the world including the world's thinnest skyscraper. It is one and a half times the height of the sky tower. Do you know why they can build so tall there? Any Americans in the house? <laughs> why is Manhattan the home of so many skyscrapers? For well, one reason is the whole island is made up of layers of solid rock. As Pastor Tony Evans points out, the stronger the foundations, the higher you can go. That applies to buildings, and it applies to you and me. So when it comes to our lives, What are our foundations? What are your foundations? What is a firm foundation? And how can we build that firm foundation? Before we start building our lives in 2024, surely we must make sure we're building on the right foundation. That's what we look at today. Now, as I was preparing this message, I was sitting at a cafe in Sylvia Park, just watching people walk by. On the surface, they all looked so similar, well-dressed, happily chatting away, happily wandering in and out of shops. But what lay beneath the surface? What had they built their lives on? What drove them? Well, maybe for that smartly dressed guy in a suit, going forward, walking purposefully, maybe his foundation was living a life of significance and contribution and purpose, of feeling useful and needed and productive. Take that away and he wouldn't know what to do with himself. I can relate. Or what about that young couple holding hands? Maybe their foundation in this season 
was their love for each other. Or what about that lady dressed like a hippie? Maybe her foundation was freedom. A life where she got to follow her heart. Follow her dreams. Pursue happiness. And stay true to her feelings. Now, this was a silly exercise because you cannot tell someone's foundation just by looking at them. Even you may not know what your foundation is until the storm hits. And the rain falls and the floods come and the wind blows and beats against your life. In other words, when you go through a crisis, Often that's when your foundations are revealed. You may have built your life on good things. Purpose, family, contribution, wealth, the pursuit of happiness. But these things are still unworthy of being your ultimate thing. As Tim Keller points out, the essence of idolatry Idolatry happens when we take good things and make them ultimate things. So, what is the ultimate thing? What is the one thing that you can build your life on? That firm foundation, that rock that will weather every storm and stand the test of time. Well, listen to the words of someone who faced crisis after crisis. And he didn't just survive, but he thrived. His life achieved greatness. Let me read out his words. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my strength in whom I will trust. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. The pangs of death surrounded me the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple and my cry came before him even to his ears. The Lord thundered from heaven. The Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. He sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his ordinances were before me, and his statutes, his statutes I did not put away from me. For who is God except the Lord? And who is a rock besides our God? The God who has girded me with strength and made my way safe. These are the words of King David, who made his foundation God. He echoes the words of the prophet Isaiah, trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord himself, is the rock eternal. But how did David make the Lord 
his foundation. Was it just wishful thinking? Did he simply call on God like a, a lucky charm and hope that things would work out? No. Look at verses 21 and 22 of Psalm 18. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his ordinances were before me, and his statutes I did not put away from me. In other words, David focused on living out the words of God. That is why God was his foundation. And that's exactly what Jesus is calling you and I to do. To live out his words. Faith without action is dead. It dies stillborn. The cycle of faith is to hear the word of God, believe the word of God, and then do the word of God. That's what completes the cycle. That's what brings faith, that's what brings faith alive. Until you do the words of God, you have not completed the cycle. Hear, believe, do. That's how you build your foundation on the rock eternal. In Jesus' own words, he says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. But how many know that is not easy? It's easy to hear the words of God. It's a lot harder to do the words of God. Because God's words often go against our natural inclinations. It's easy to lash out in anger. It's a lot harder to turn the other cheek. It's easy to hate your enemies. It's a lot harder to love those who persecute you. It's easy to go shopping at Sylvia Park. It's a lot harder to spend the same amount of time in prayer. Building your foundation on the words of God involves dying to yourself, denying yourself of saying like Jesus, your will, Father, not mine be done. It's easy to build on sand. You don't have to go deep. Building on rock demands a life of continual discomfort. But as Jerzy Gergorgic puts it, easy choices, hard life. Hard choices, easy life. Unlike a building, your foundations, my foundations need to be built every single day. Because every choice you and I make, every action you and I take, is directing your foundations either towards rock or sand. Listen to the words of C.S. Lewis. People often think of Christian, Christian morality as a kind of bargain with, in which God says, if you keep a lot of rules, I'll reward you. And if you don't, I'll do the other. I do not think that that is the best way of looking at it. 
I would much rather say that every time you make a choice, you are turning the central part of you, the part of you that chooses, into something a little different from what it was before. And taking your life as a whole with all your innumerable choices, all your life long, you are slowly turning the central part of you, the central thing, into a heavenly creature or into a hellish creature. Either into a creature that is in harmony with God and with other creatures and with itself. Or else into one that is in a state of war and hatred with God and its fellow creatures and with itself. To be the one kind of creature is heaven. That is, it is joy and peace and knowledge and power. To be the other means madness, horror, idiocy, rage, impotence, and eternal loneliness. Each of us, at each moment, is progressing to one state or the other. As we draw to a close, I want to leave you with a challenge for 2024. If you attend a church service regularly, well done. You will hear and hopefully believe the words of God. Steps one and two completed. But my challenge for you and for me is this. Take one thing you hear from the sermon and apply it that week. Just one thing. Maybe over Sunday lunch you can discuss as a family what is the one thing I am going to apply from the word of God I heard today. If it's unclear what the sermon is asking you to do differently, then us preachers have failed. Because every sermon, as we're taught at Kerry, must have a function statement. A now go and do this statement. So will you accept this challenge and not just hear the words of God? but to apply the words of God. In 2024, you can build the foundations of your life on the rock eternal. Like King David, your life will stand the test of time. I want to end by looking at the foundation of the one on whom you and I must build our own foundation. The words of God didn't just tickle his ears. They led him to an agonizing death on the cross. And he went because the words of God were meant to be lived out. Because to him, the words of God were more important than life itself. After 40 days in the wilderness, when Jesus was close to death for lack of food, he said these words. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Let's pray.
Lord, you have given us your name. If we are to live as Christians, we must do what Christ tells us to do. But Lord, we cannot do it by ourselves. We cannot do what you did and die to ourselves. We are too tempted to build our lives on other foundations. Only by your Spirit in us can we hope to build our lives on the rock. I pray for each and every one of my brothers and sisters here and watching through YouTube that today they would make this commitment, they would take this challenge to take one thing from every sermon they hear and apply it that very week. May their foundations run deep so that their lives go high. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.